Yeah, there were a couple of things I, I thought a lot about, you know, what you might want, what people might want to understand about scoliosis. And I would like to go to your questions, but um, I, you know, just to kind of review a couple of basic concepts, like what makes a person with scoliosis a little bit different than any ordinary person that has a little bit of scoliosis that mm -hmm. we understand in postural restoration. Mm -hmm. and. That is that there, in, in most cases, there's structural change in the, sp in the spine, but the spine results in structural change also in the rib cage and all the physiological systems as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, so posture restoration is like uniquely well positioned to deal in an integrated fashion with people who are underlying the same as all the rest of us but have some of these structural changes and especially um, people who are very young who have this change come about they don't know why it comes about mm -hmm. um, and people who are old who may have it come about either they had it all their life or it comes about because of breakdown from overuse of patterns mm -hmm. so scoliosis is is actually diagnosed from an x-ray that shows a side curve of the spine that's at least 10 degrees, call it Cobb angle. And that's if you were looking at a person from the front and you see a side to side curve right. in the spine. And, um, and that could be a functional curve. In a young person, that could be a functional curve or a structural curve. And if it's a functional curve, it's just from habit or the way they're moving. And that could just disappear by itself Right. or it would develop into a structural curve where there's actual vertebral wedging and, um, and rotation. So now there's a, a change that's harder to reposition because it's become structural. Oh. And because of that uh, structural change, these folks um, and people's curves are, are unique. They're, there's nobody that's going to walk into your clinic or your practice and have the same curve as the next person. Mm -hmm. There is a common pattern. The most common pattern mirrors the right BC, left AIC pattern. That is, there's usually a right thoracic prominence. So the right back of the rib cage is prominent. Mm -hmm. And if there's a balancing curve underneath, it's on the left lumbar area or thoracolumbar area. So that's the most common pattern. But it's really kind of important uh, when you are, when you are um, starting to work with these folks to have a sense of what their spine is actually doing because you can't always tell from just looking at the outside of them, see right. what's happening on the inside. So we like to really get x-rays to see what a spinal configuration is actually happening so that when we give them an exercise we can tailor it to their unique curve pattern mm -hmm. and it's really important for them to know what their unique curve pattern is so that they can um, they can also tailor their moments of awareness of self mm -hmm. to minimize the habits that take them into their curve pattern and reinforce it. So how, how do you go about educating them? Is it just like showing them the pictures and saying, this is where you have to be careful? Because it, it's even when you're looking at pictures, it can be kind of abstract if you're not trained in it. And I, even I'm not, I'm not trained in it. For me, it's even abstract, no matter how much PRI I may know, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with someone who's got extra curve, who has scoliosis intimidates me and I don't want to answer incorrectly. So I'm always, a, I don't have a lot of answers to give people, but how do you, so you're saying that everyone has, there is this commonality of the majority of, of scoli scoliotic curves, but then inside that part, inside that commonality, there's, there's variations and everyone's going to be slightly different, just like everyone has different fingerprints or tongue prints. And so, yeah, so what giving you can only so when people ask questions we can give general ideas but without seeing someone 
up close and their x-rays, it's, you can't know for sure. So they need specialized, uh, they need specialized guidance. I but, think they do you know, need specialized guidance. Someone just, yeah, so someone just saying, hey, what'd you do for your scoliosis <laughs> is really not the best way to approach it because not all scol scoliosis is built the same. Exactly, exactly. So it's, you, there are not really formulas because you want to really have a sense of what, what's happening inside this particular person. Um, and um, yeah, so, so when we design programs for these people, um, oh, I wanted, to, I wanted to back up and say, so the structural curves are a little bit more, um, a little harder to work with. So if we're talking about younger people, you can see somebody with a functional curve or a structural curve. And a functional curve is based on habit and pattern. And that can even disappear by itself or it can progress and get worse. And a young person, you know, could be somebody in their teens, somebody younger than that. Usually by the time they're in their, their later teens, it's, um, it's not functional so much anymore. Mm. But a functional curve uh, is, is much easier to work with. And if somebody's showing up with a functional curve, it's probably worth beginning balancing activities um, so that they don't progress into a structural curve. And I had a great example of that when I first started working with scoliosis in our clinic. A, a young girl, nine-year-old, came in with a 27-degree curve. And she, she had had a 13-degree curve the year before, and it went all the way to 27 degrees in one year, and the mom was getting kind of nervous. The doctors were saying, oh, don't worry about it. Um, you know, it may disappear, or, you know, we'll just keep an eye on it. But right. mom wasn't going to do that. And this girl, um, she just had a habit of standing on her left leg, not her right leg. And she couldn't even stand on her right leg. Mm -hmm. Anyway, three months and five sessions later, her spine was straight. We know her curve must have been a functional curve. And she went back to the doctor and they were like blown away. Like, how did this happen? Mm -hmm. But we just worked on getting her back into a more balanced position in her daily activities. Um, okay, so you said balance, um, you, a couple minutes ago, before you started talking about it, you said you're gonna work on balancing exercises. You're not, you don't mean like standing on one leg balancing, you mean like balancing out the body. Is, what do you mean by balancing? Cause I don't know if people are gonna understand what you exactly meant by that. Very good, thank you for asking that. So when a person has a, um, a side curve. They also have front to back curves. I mean, everybody I've ever seen are in our clinic. We know that everybody's got a front to back. That is a sagittal plane mm -hmm. dysfunction as well as a side to side dysfunction. You can't really separate those out. And so these curves are um, exaggerated. That means that on one side of the curve, muscles are overstretched on the convex side. And on the concave side, muscles are shorter and tighter. And you would wanna be balancing the muscle activity on the two sides of the curve to see if you could begin balancing the forces that are affecting the spine. Because those muscles are affecting the way the muscles are working and taking one into one's habitual activities are affecting the spine. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing that we had talked about last time that I thought was really important is that a rib cage uh, connects to a spine, articulates with a spine. And when a spine begins to develop curves, the rib cage changes shape. And all of the people that I've seen with scoliosis have a pretty prominent left anterior lower rib cage, which we see in many people. It's a little more exaggerated in, in uh, some folks with scoliosis. And they have that right thoracic prominence. And this begins to change the shape of the rib cage, and it loses its nice relative symmetry and begins to really uh, change shape pretty significantly. So yeah. that there's this big space in front and this big space behind. Air, when we breathe in, 
follows the path of least resistance. And by always going into that direction of rib cage, it, at, it reinforces that rib cage position. And then it reinforces the spine position because of the rib cage attachment to the spine. Mm. So a very important component of what we're doing when we do exercises is to um, begin directing air into a right apical chest and a left posterior mediastinum as we would do in many posture restoration exercises to begin to reposition a rib cage to begin to realign a spine. And the other thing I wanna say about that is that people, can, people who have a hard time feeling themselves or being aware of where their body is in space or they can't find uh, they can't find muscles, they can't feel muscles. Sometimes they can feel air expansion and the air expansion can be their cue that their position is correct because they're feeling air moving into spaces that they don't usually feel air moving into. Right. Um, so, uh, so you were saying you're using air to reposition and direct the rib cage, which then moves the spine into a better position. So you're not direct from a certain perspective or from our, my perspective, you're not directly, you're indirectly influencing the spine, but you're not necessarily touching the spine. It's not like you're trying to untwist the spine directly. You're doing it through directing the rib cage, which articulates with that spine via internal pressures of air. Right. So you're kind of backdooring it. So you're not, because a lot of people, you know, like with the neck, people always say, all right, how do I get my neck to relax? Oh, like, I'm going to have you stand on your left leg and breathe. Like, you know, you never, I remember Ron saying once, and before I really understood it, he said, oh, we, I, I relax necks all the time, but I never touch the neck. And of course, eventually you understand that if you ground yourself properly through that left side, the neck will relax as you ground and compress that left hip and get grounded on the left side, the neck relaxes. So I always tell people, yeah, yeah, we'll take care of your neck, but we're not touching your neck. We're going to work on that grounding on the left side and, you know, left heel, right arch, compression of the left hip. It's very abstract. Like, well, how are you going to, how are you going to, how are you going to help my neck relax if you don't touch my neck? So, you know, people think scoliosis, or they're going to think spines, they're not going to think air and rib cage. So I just want to reinforce the fact that you, you can't treat a spine without influencing the rib cage through airflow. Well, I won't say you can't, but that's definitely a very strong component of what we do and also of what Schroth did. So the most common, there are many techniques for scoliosis specific therapies are out there um, in Europe, especially in the United States of those therapies, Schroth is the most um, known and people who, are, who have scoliosis look up Schroth therapy. We are all, we're all certified at the advanced level in Schroth, but I would say that in our clinic, we use probably 80 to 90% posture restoration mm -hmm. to Schroth because posture restoration is so multi-system integrated and is so effective at repositioning um, biomechanics using respiration and neurology. So, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, I think I lost track of what that question was. Well, no, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to reinforce the idea that in order to influence a spine, probably long-term, you have to work, your be, uh, you'll have probably better outcomes if you are influencing the rib cage through respiration, which will then allow that spine to uh, move into a better position. It, it facilitates it for sure. It's a very powerful influence. And one of the ways that we get to direct air, again, this is a postural restoration known, is position. So when you you just told us when you stand a person on their left side, that's how you're gonna and ask them to breathe. That's how they begin to loosen up their neck. The exercise positions 
um, in posture restoration are extraordinary for redirecting airflow. Right. And so these positions often are very opposite to a position that a person has got familiar with. And they may feel uncomfortable or uh, disorienting mm -hmm. uh, because of the habits that they've developed around this is who I am and this is where I think I'm straight, even though when you look at me, I'm not at all straight. Right. If I look at myself in the mirror, sometimes people don't even see it when they look at themselves in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So, so um, using position to, first of all, I mean, position does a lot of things. The, the exercise positions shorten, over lengthen muscles, lengthen, shorten muscles, as well as assisting passively to direct air. And then this um, emphasis on kinesthetic self-awareness is really hugely important for people with scoliosis, for everybody. For everybody, for people, yeah. For everybody, and for people with scoliosis, because they need to begin to recognize what's habit and where they want to go to. And that process is, of course, a process of repositioning, retraining, rebuilding a new recognition of uh, where I could live and where I could live comfortably. And do they, re do they resist, do, do, do you ever find people resisting it? Like say, like you, like you know what they need, but to them it's just so foreign and so uncomfortable? Yes, yeah, so of course, um, we're, we're talking about um, a really big spectrum from really, really young, like Lisa's working with infants and, and um, juveniles as well as teens, to very, very old who have lived their whole life this way and are very accommodated to where they are. So, you know, a lot depends on how willing a person is to go through that process. And it's, it's a long process. We, we don't usually we don't usually get through a, a scoliosis program really quickly. We tell most people that come, it's going to take a minimum of 20 sessions for you to just begin to get an understanding of the direction that you want to move into because we're dealing with structural changes as well. And, um, and we're dealing with bringing the changes that they're feeling in their exercises into their life, into their ADL activities, their activities of daily living, and their breathing. So it's a, it's quite a process. That it's a, it's a, it's a commitment. commitment. Yeah, it's a commitment to, I, even with myself, it, I realized this, <laughs> this summer, how much of my waking moments have been devoted to, to my own body management, just, can, just managing my body throughout my whole life, really. And it, 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 can, it can become overwhelming for people because they think about it constantly. And I know from my own experience, once you get to a certain level where you're feeling so much better, you then fear going back. Mm -hmm. And so even when you're feeling good, you almost get nervous, like, what if I go back to the old way of living? What if I can't hold on to my gains? So there's so many different uh, thought processes that go on in someone who is trying to make these changes for the better. And the anxiety of, will it work? And then once, and then once it does work pretty well, it's the anxiety of, can it last? Can this last? It's like when people win a Super Bowl. Like, will Peyton Manning win a Super Bowl? It's great. Oh, we finally won the Super Bowl. And it's like, all right, are you going to do it next year? Now you, have to, now, you, now you have to repeat. You know, it's like the Beatles. They, get, they become the biggest band in the world, and now people expect them to remain on top. And now they have extra pressure. So it's almost like this, you have to deal with this, can I get there? And then once I get there, can I maintain it? And then there's that fear of, oh, what if it comes back? And then if you feel a pain, like, oh, my God, is it back? And it, people fall into that that cycle, that kind of wheel of suffering that I, I know it myself. <laughs> so I just wonder how, with someone who has to go through a program of 20 weeks or, you know, or, or 20 sessions, because they have these, these real challenges, 
like that. I always wonder about the, 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 the psychological component of, of that. So a, a couple of things that I would like to say about that. I think that um, the people for, who resonate with a program like that and can make that commitment, mm -hmm. and sometimes it takes a couple of sessions to really get that to happen, it's, it's a very empowering process because people who have never had any sense of themselves or any sense that I can, um, I can shift things, small things in myself and have a big different experience from that, um, I think is a wonderful, a wonderful empowering possibility. Um, and I think that that lasts for the rest of their lives. For the rest of their lives, they don't feel like they're only uh, at the mercy of what other people are telling them, but they have a way of going inside and seeing, how am I breathing? How am I feeling? Could I make an adjustment to how I'm breathing and how I'm feeling to be more comfortable in a situation that, you know, I feel like I might lose all of that. Mm. And at the, um, at the advanced integration course, I go through this little, I, I heard this from Ron and I, I love it. And I tell it to almost all of my patients. It's, it's a sequence that starts with unconscious incompetence. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You know, we start out, we don't even know anything's wrong. You know, we, we don't feel great, but, but as far as we're concerned, you know, we don't notice anything. Right. Then we get into this program, we start noticing like all of our incompetencies, conscious incompetence. Yeah. It's a very uncomfortable place to be, very uncomfortable. But it's totally necessary part of the process to start recognizing where I'm living is not a great place to be. I don't want to always be back here. Why do I keep ending up here? Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the motivation that gets us to conscious competence where what you say, I'm having to pay attention to things. I'm having to work hard. I'm having to, oh, I lost it. I have to go find it and get back to it. Um, but really the end of the process or the goal of the process is unconscious competence where I've uh, internalized enough of these um, changes. I've rebuilt habits so that I, I'm a little more secure, unconsciously competent. Right. You know, we're always going to fall back and have to reboot. But, right. but to get to the, that, the, that place where I have stretches of unconscious competence is exhilarating, mm -hmm. empowering, yeah. joyful. I, I read about those. I, I think there's six phases of them like starting with unconscious incompetence. And I think, I think there's, there's five or six, I believe. I, I read it uh, quite some time ago, but I applied it to dance teaching. And when I first, early in my career of dance teaching, I, I applied it and I was like, oh, wow, this actually describes the learning process pretty well. You know, unconscious, incompetence, they have these people have no clue that they can't dance. They don't know <laughs> what they're doing wrong. They have no awareness that they're doing it completely wrong. Uh, and then eventually they have conscious incompetence in the fact that they know they did something wrong. They just can't, con they can't correct it though. But they know it didn't feel right, but they don't know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they can recognize that they did something wrong and realize what they have to do. They know what they did wrong. And then they can fix it eventually. And they get to the point that there's literally no, they're not making any mistakes and they're not thinking about it. They're based, it's just complete they can if someone can have a conversation and dance at the same time with a partner they know it because they don't have to think about the movements mm -hmm. and that's I even, I even do that with people with pri techniques i'm saying i want you to be able to talk to me while you move into that position and do the exercise i don't want you then you've mastered it mm -hmm. because if you can talk to me while you're doing this exercise it means you know how to shift into that left hip you know how to close down your frontal plane on the left side uh, I don't tell everyone that, but with people who are really getting it, I want them to get to that point. I, this should be auto, I want this to be automatic for you. And, and for people with scoliosis, to bring that competence into their life is really important. So